So I'm vegan, obviously, but I don't really like a lot of the vegan documentaries, particularly the ones focused on health, right? What the health, the game changers, forks over knives. Almost always they lack nuance and exaggerate claims, or even worse, they misinform, like fat. They usually focus on low fat. They demonize all fats, not just saturated fat and trans fat. Well, we have a new one, a four episode Netflix series called You Are What You Eat, a twin experiment. They follow four sets of twins, Charlie and Michael, Wendy and Pam, Rosalind and Carolyn, and Javon and John. One twin is put on a healthy omnivore diet and the other on a healthy vegan diet for eight weeks. And so they test them at baseline at the beginning. And then at the end of the eight weeks for various things. They do DEXA scans, they test LDL, sexual arousal to see if anything changes by the end of the eight weeks. This is actually based on that twin study I talked about recently. These are eight of the twins from that study. I think there were a total of 42 21 pairs. I go into it in a lot more detail in that video, but basically it's a really cool study. It's actually a video where I'm talking about a study being cool and being excited about a study. So that's fun. Uh, so maybe this documentary, maybe it's different from the other ones. Maybe it's not vegan propaganda or more accurately, low fat vegan propaganda. Speaking of low fat, this is one of the things I really love about the series. It does not promote a low fat vegan diet. Spoilers, I guess this is a pro vegan documentary. I don't know if you could really say vegan, but it's definitely pro plant-based eating. From the get go, they make it pretty clear that they want you to eat more plants and less animals, but not low fat. There's no Dr. McDougall starch solution. He promotes a low fat vegan diet. There's no Dr. Neil Barnard, again, promotes a low fat vegan diet. There's no Esselstein. Garth Davis, I'm pretty sure he also promotes a low fat vegan diet. They are not in this at all. Not once does anyone in the show demonize nuts and seeds or avocados or anything like that. It's great. Like the study, the series is pretty balanced in terms of health and the expectation of outcomes. They emphasize when it comes to certain things that they're not really sure or they wouldn't expect to see a big change. And they also emphasize, I think several times throughout the four episodes, that the goal was to compare a healthy omnivore diet to a healthy vegan diet. They didn't just want to compare a healthy balanced vegan diet to a crappy omnivore diet because obviously the vegan diet's gonna do better. They wanted it to be fair. Another cool thing is microbiome. Now this is not in the study. They do have a comment in the study about it being in a future analysis, which makes sense because they did collect stool samples. I'm guessing that is primarily what it's for. But at the end of the four episodes, they do talk about this and they do talk about the vegans having seemingly better microbiome results at the end of the eight weeks. Pretty cool. Biological age and telomere length. This is another one that's not in the study, but I believe it's going to be part of the follow-up. I'm not exactly sure, but just based on this final episode where they're going through all of the results and they've got seemingly all of or most of the twins there, not just the twins who were in the show, in the documentary. It seems like this is actually part of the study. And interesting findings. Again, this is one of those where you wouldn't really expect to see much of a difference after eight weeks, but they did in fact find that the vegan vegans had longer telomeres at the end of eight weeks, whereas the omnivores saw no change. Longer is good, <laughs> if you weren't aware. Now, biological age, cellular age, whatever you want to call it, is really in its infancy. And telomere length is not the only marker and probably shouldn't be used on its own. They do also talk about epigenetic clock. But yeah, it's a pretty new science and the show kind of presents it as like a, a, a done science, if that makes sense. If your biological age is higher than the age that is dependent on your date of birth, that actually has significant clinical implications. There's no like concrete agreed upon way to even and measure biological age. So again, it's it's very new. I.e. don't pay 300 bucks or whatever it is for any of those like biological aging tests. Just, just don't. At one point, Carolyn and Rosalind are asked to prepare a chicken dish. And what they don't know is that the chicken, chicken breast has been covered in this glow germ. It shows up under a black light. So the goal of this is to show how pathogens are spread. And even though they are being very careful, they wash their hands before, they wash their hands after handling the chicken before moving on to the vegetables and whatnot. Um, yeah, it, it gets everywhere. Even though they are seemingly doing the right things, it's just so hard to keep 
the kitchen clean when you are handling raw animal products. This is actually very similar to that Poisoned documentary that came out last year. Theirs was actually less impactful, I think. They just did kind of a made-up one. They didn't have like a more uh, real-world scenario showing you how easy it is to spread E. coli, salmonella, all of that. But uh, yeah, I have a video on that documentary too, if you're interested. I love this so much. So we're introduced to a regenerative agriculture farmer. This is in the second episode, I think. For those who don't know, regenerative agriculture is this idea that ruminant animals like cows are actually good for the environment, that when they are farmed correctly, so like not factory farming, they actually sequester carbon. Many people have criticized regenerative ag for its lack of evidence, for downplaying the harmfulness of methane, and for being inefficient. For all of its flaws, factory farming feeds a lot of people. Regenerative ag cannot because it requires so much more land. And that is essentially what this farmer says. Even though he obviously believes in regenerative agriculture, he does not believe it can scale. He does not believe we can use it to feed people the amount of meat we currently eat, which I think is so powerful, right? It's one thing to hear a vegan say, farming is bad, regenerative agriculture is inefficient. It's a whole nother thing to see someone who practices it, who believes in it say, this is not a solution, it can't be scaled. The solution is eating less animals, eating more plants. It's pretty awesome. They interview another farmer, this one not regenerative ag, but just regular factory farmer. He farmed chickens and he talks about them being crammed into small spaces. He says that he thinks they were bred to suffer. Then we find out in the final episode that he is no longer a chicken farmer. He actually met up with the CEO of Mercy for Animals, which is a farm animal advocacy group did that years ago and now farms mushrooms. He says at one point, get us an alternative and the consumer demands it, we'll be glad to do it. This is really the only part where they talk about like animal cruelty, animal welfare at all. But again, I think it's so powerful hearing from people, from actual farmers, people who know inside and out how the system works and to hear him say like, they never asked him to do anything cruel. It's just the system itself is inherently cruel. As you can see, just from the, the little I've talked about this here, they talk about a lot in this four-part series. Each episode is around 40, 45, 50 minutes. And honestly, at first, that first episode, it's, I don't know, I finished it like, whoa, this is kind of confused. Like, what, what are they focusing on here? Because they go from DEXA scans to climate change to pig shit, you know, infesting like communities of color. Like, what? This is... What? But after watching all four episodes, I think it's a much more cohesive message than that. I think it's just like, look, eating animals offers little to no benefits and it harms obviously the animals. It harms the environment. It even harms people who don't eat the animals, right? Just communities living next to these operations. If that's the case, why? Why would we continue to farm and eat these animals. As one of the twins says, there are just too many benefits to cutting out meat and not enough to keep it in your diet. Now, the bad stuff. So one of the things I was really looking forward to was seeing the food they actually prepare, what they eat. Because in the study, they do talk about the first four weeks, they are provided meals from this trifecta company. And then the last four, they prepare them on their own. And you can see the guidelines they have, how many fruits and vegetables they're supposed to eat, all that stuff. You can see their macros. So you can get a sense of what they're eating. But I really wanted to see like what they're eating. And they don't really show that at all in this four part series. It's kind of amazing. You get a couple shots of, oh, here's one of the trifecta meals, tofu and whatever. You get them talking about making fake bit bitong or something. It's some sort of meat product, Wendy and Pam. They make a, a vegan one, but there's no like, here's an example of one of my meals. You know what I mean? I thought it was going to be more uh, of that sort of thing. And it's really not at all, especially since they do briefly talk about issues, mostly with the guys. Uh, I think it's Charlie, Charlie and Michael. Charlie is the one eating vegan and he talks about struggling to eat enough, feeling like he's stuffing himself. And then I think it's Javon or is it John? Maybe it's John who was eating the vegan one. And he says that he was worried about getting enough protein. Oh, and then Wendy and Pam, they talk about just feeling like they're eating so many carbs, just beans, beans, beans. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. It was kind of disappointing. 
So I mentioned the DEXA scan. The twins have a DEXA scan done at the beginning and at the end. This is for testing bone mineral density. It's also used to check for lean muscle mass and fat mass. So this is marketed to the masses as like a, hey, the scale lies to you. Let's see how healthy you truly are, that sort of thing. Anyway, there's the short part on BMI being dog shit because if you are like a six foot, 250 pound bodybuilder, your BMI will be obese. It'll tell you you're unhealthy. Rather suspect coming from someone who literally makes money telling people BMI is dog shit, right? Like BMI sucks. Come pay $150 for a DEXA scan. I don't know how much it is. I'm sure it's not cheap. But to be fair, she's certainly not the first person to make this argument against BMI. And yeah, if you're using BMI to say, oh, look, my BMI is in the healthy range. I'm healthy. That's incorrect. That's not how it's supposed to be used. It is just one health marker of many. And while yes, there are outliers like bodybuilders that, you know, it's not really giving you a whole lot of information. They have a whole lot more muscle mass than your average, you know, 40 BMI or whatever person. Those are outliers, right? There are always exceptions to the rules. And overall, BMI is one fairly decent indicator of health, right? I mean, you can pretty much guarantee that someone with a BMI of 22 is going to be healthier than someone with a BMI of 40. There are always exceptions to the rule. It does not mean BMI is dog shit, and it does not mean you need to get a DEXA scan to know if you're healthy. Speaking of the DEXA scans, these were not a part of the study, and they are not going to be part of the follow-up either. Christopher Gardner, the senior author, he says the showrunners really wanted it in the series, but obviously that's very expensive so they just did it for these four sets of twins, these eight twins, which to be fair to the showrunners, that makes sense, right? People really, really care about muscle loss and fat loss. So it makes sense you would want to have it in there. But any results are basically meaningless because again, we're only talking about four separate comparisons. The vegans lost more visceral fat. Okay. The omnivores gained more muscle. Okay, it's eight people. And they're also exercising, they're strength training, they're doing cardio. There are so many other factors, like who gives a shit? And they, they spend so much time on this. It's, it's rather frustrating, honestly. So remember in the Game Changers, remember the stupid erection study, the little experiment they did? They do the same thing here, but with women. They attempt to track changes in sexual arousal, really blood flow is what they're looking at, by measuring the heat in the ladies' genitals while they are watching porn. At the end of the eight weeks, they see a huge difference for the vegans. Wow, so meaningful. Two comparisons, this is not part of the study. <laughs> and why did they do this with just the ladies? Like may maybe it was just to counter the game changers, right? Which was like male focus. Maybe they wanted to do a lady focused one. Maybe the boys were just too shy. Maybe the showrunners just realized that like, no one wants to know what dudes are masturbating to, but 40 year old women, getting off on hentai. It's kind of adorable. Oh God, so much time, so much time is spent on the stupid restaurant, the 11, Par no, 11 Madison Park. Is that what it's called? The Michelin star one. It had three Michelin stars and then the, the owner or top chef, whatever. Top chef. Remember that show? Is that still on? He said, hey, I want it to be vegan now and still keep the stars. And he did. He did it. That's the, that's the story. Turns out a guy who was really, really good at cooking meat is really, really good at cooking vegetables too. It makes up such a large part of this series and it's just boring as shit. It really has nothing to do with being healthy on a plant-based diet. And it's so out of like most people's reach. Like most of the people watching this are never gonna go to that restaurant couldn't if, even if they were there because it's incredibly expensive. The only relevant part is when the regenerative agriculture uh, farmer actually goes there and has this like epiphany of, wow, this was really delicious. And I think he writes to the chef just telling him like, he couldn't believe the power of plants or whatever. Like that's, that's fine. But seriously, it makes up such a large portion of this documentary. I don't get it. Eric Adams. I talked about him recently in my vegan news for 2023 and talked about just what a powerful figure he has been for veganism and plant-based eating. He is, for those who don't know, he's the mayor of NYC and he has been hugely influential. He has actually made plant-based meals the default in all of the public 
hospitals in New York City. It's huge. It's amazing. They talk about it briefly in this documentary. They also talk about diabetes. And Eric Adams shares his story of being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and saying, no, I don't want to go on insulin. So I'm going to try to fix this myself. And I think he Googles like reverse diabetes. And he comes across Dr. Greger and starts working with him. And according to him, it works. And he goes and sees his doctor, his endocrinologist, and she says, wow, the medicine's really working. Your A1C levels are great. And he says, no, actually, I never took the medication and like puts all the meds out on the table. While he never says, hey, don't take your insulin, just eat plants. I, I think it's a little irresponsible on the showrunner's part to put this in here without any sort of context without any sort of like, hey, if you just get off your med, like you could die. Like don't no. Maybe that's patronizing, infantilizing, but it just made it made me uncomfortable watching it. And it made uh Christopher Gardner, again, the senior author, made him seemingly a little bit uncomfortable too. Vice emailed him about this and he said, most people who are prescribed medicines should take them and take all of them. In fact, even when prescribed and prescriptions are filled, many people do not take all of their meds and this can be problematic for their care. Interestingly, this whole story might be a lie. It seems that in the past, Eric Adams has said that he did actually take the medications and they had bad side effects for him. Adams has developed a reputation for telling conflicting or opaque stories about such subjects as whether or not he is actually a vegan, whether or not he lives in New York City, and the nature of his relationship to donors with ties to the Turkish government. Okay. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that one of the guys, I think it's Charlie, talks about really struggling to eat enough because he feels like he has to stuff himself eating all plants, eating vegan foods. And he really isn't offered any advice. I mean, maybe he was and it was cut out, right? We don't know for sure. But what is included in the documentary is just this uh, personal trainer who's been vegetarian his whole life. I forgot his name. But he says like, hey, this is a common thing. People don't eat enough calories. And then they blame the vegan diet and plant foods are less calorically dense. So you get to eat more of them. How does that help him? That's not his issue. His issue is he can't eat enough. He physically is having trouble. Like maybe tell him some more calorically dense vegan foods that he can eat to help him get enough calories. It's, I don't know, it comes across as really just not helpful and weird and like vegan propaganda-ish, you know? Like something Freely would say, hey, you get to eat as many calories as you want. Okay, but like my stomach exploded and it hurts. Keep eating. <laughs> now we get into, I guess, a little bit of nitpicking. Some other little problems, mostly things that are said by various people in the documentary that made me go, mm, what? No? In the first episode, this neurologist says, for Alzheimer's, only 3% of cases have that kind of genetic pattern where if they have the gene, they will develop it. In more than 90% of cases, lifestyle is what pushes the manifestation of the disease. This is rather vague, but I think the 3% th she's talking about is referring to the early onset Alzheimer's, which is very rare. That's the Alzheimer's in that like Julianne Moore movie that you get when you're like 40, 50. The 90% comment might be referring to the this rather large study on lifestyle and cognition. The participants with four to six healthy habits had much slower memory decline than those with zero to one healthy habit. And that was for all the participants, including those with the gene variant tied to Alzheimer's. But I seriously doubt many experts on age-related mental decline would make such a bold claim that 90% of Alzheimer's cases are caused by lifestyle alone. I don't know. From the get-go, the meat industry has made sure that no dietary recommendation ever says eat less meat. They can live with eat less saturated fat. So historically, this is true, but I just saw this again when I was doing my video on the twin study. On the USDA website, on their MyPlate website, they have a protein section and they say, most Americans eat enough from the protein foods group, but need to select leaner varieties of meat and poultry. They may also need to increase the variety of protein foods selected and choose meats less often. Wishy-washy, watery language, sure, but like choose meats less often effectively means like eat less meat or you may need, you may need to eat less meat. I don't bring this up to go after Marion Nestle or anything. Again, I think she's like a mostly right until very recently. I just bring this up 
really is like a, hey, look, things are changing. It's very slow, but things are changing. And I have no doubt eventually we'll have language that's like, hey, you may need to like eat less animal products, right? Not just meat, but animal products. And then eventually like eat less animal products. Don Staniford, he is an activist. He's focused on salmon farming and the horrors of salmon farming. He talks about the difference between farmed and wild salmon in terms of fat. Farmed is far oilier. And that's not good oils either. That's omega-6s. So omega-3s are really important, right? And if we are reducing the amount of EPA, DHA in salmon, that is obviously reducing its usefulness. That's like the only reason to eat salmon, right? Is that it's one of the one of the few whole food sources of EPA and DHA. But that doesn't mean omega-6s are harmful, right? We have the whole seed oil crowd and even before like the seed oil stuff, this has been around for a while, this belief that omega-6s are pro-inflammatory because the body can convert it to arachidonic acid, but the studies don't support this. It turns out that the body converts very little linolenic acid into arachidonic acid, even when linolenic acid is abundant in the diet. The AHA reviewers found that eating more omega-6 fats didn't rev up inflammation. Instead, eating more omega-6 fats either reduced markers of inflammation or left them unchanged. The balance of omega-6 to omega-3 is important. It's not clear how how important, but it's very likely that many of us are not eating enough omega-3s. However, improving this balance shouldn't come at the expense of omega-6s. It's clear that we should just eat more omega-3s, not reduce the amount of omega-6s we're eating. So towards the end, they do another DEXA scan for all of the twins, and we find that for Wendy and Pam, they do lose weight, but it is predominantly muscle mass, not fat. The trainers blame this on diet culture and on not eating enough to fuel their bodies, doing too much cardio and not eating enough. Um, and then the DEXA fit lady says, no matter the diet, if you don't eat enough, you are going to lose muscle, not fat. Look, <laughs> if you lose weight, you almost certainly will lose some amount of muscle, but you will also lose fat. But yes, and this is why I'm putting it in the nitpick area, like we should be concerned about losing muscle if we're trying to burn fat, if we're trying to lose weight. This is why strength training is so important. It can help us preserve muscle mass when we are losing weight and also eating protein, eating enough protein. Now, again, both Wendy and Pam were doing cardio. I think cardio every day, which Again, not really ideal. Obviously, it can help you burn calories, but it can also uh, inhibit your body's ability to gain muscle or even to preserve muscle while you are dieting. So that might be problematic there. And also they complained not so much about protein, but they complained about the amount of carbs they were eating. That's why they actually started doing cardio. They were concerned about the amount of carbs for both of them, for the vegan diet and for the omnivore diet. So it's possible they simply were not getting enough protein to preserve lean muscle mass. And then they were doing cardio on top of it, possibly not strength training or not strength training very much. That could I guess, lead to predominantly muscle loss instead of fat loss. It's still weird because, you know, obviously they're not super slim. They've got quite a bit of fat to lose. So it's pretty surprising that you wouldn't see, I mean, in the, the omnivore case, I can't remember if that was Pam or Wendy, but she actually gained a little bit of fat. It's, it's kind of shocking. But yeah, if you don't eat enough, you're going to lose muscle, not fat is just obviously not true. Miyoko features kind of prominently in this. She's in um, a few episodes talking mostly about cheese, obviously. They talk about her liquid cheese, the pizza cheese, which we really like. That's what we use for pizzas. Um, but there's this part where she's trying it and she's like, wow, it really looks like cheese. And it no, no, it doesn't. And she even mentions, I think she makes a comment about the stretch or something, but there's like, what are you talking? The, no, there's no stretch. We've had this cheese so many times and like, yes, it is so much better than, you know, your shreds or whatever that are so starchy and they don't really melt. Like this does melt much better, but it's not stretchy like cheese. It's not like ooey gooey like cheese. It's not it's not cheese, like at all. Thank God, because I don't want real cheese. <laughs> In a similar vein, the two guys, Michael and Charlie, they're like big cheese expert guys. They really love cheese. And then there's a part right at the end where they're like eating vegan cheese and wow, it's so good. I couldn't even tell. I couldn't tell the difference. What? What? I'm not saying they're lying, but 
Earlier, I think in that same final episode, they do talk about the omnivore one talks about cutting out meat and makes that statement like, why would he keep it in his diet? There just aren't very many benefits, right? And he's talking about going like predominantly vegan. So it seems like they're already pro-vegan. So, you know, maybe it tastes more like cheese because they want it to taste like cheese, right? But like that's there is, there's no vegan cheese that tastes like cheese. Come on. I know I haven't had cheese in a very long time, but like, no. Don't get your hopes up is all I'm saying. Final thing, again about Miyoko. Um, it's just a little awkward because she's not actually with Miyoko's anymore. She's not with the company anymore, which I'm sure is hard for her. It's like, it's her name, right? It's, it's her. She is the company, but she's not anymore. So it's a little bit awkward her promoting the company basically the whole time and talking about making the cheeses and everything. It's a little weird, especially since they are actually, I don't know if there's a lawsuit, but it's, it wasn't a, uh, an amicable split, it seems like. And they've actually accused her of trying to steal recipes. They say they have footage of her and another employee or former employee, like trying to take company property. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but it's just, I don't know. It's very funny to me. So, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was a little, it was a little awkward watching it, honestly. And also, I think this is in the last episode, she makes a comment about like intentionally reinventing the food system, you know, by selling these cheeses and whatever, but she doesn't seem to actually believe that anymore. I read in a, an interview with her or just a statement in an article that she doesn't really believe in making vegan products and helping animals and the environment that way by increasing demand, as a result, possibly decreasing demand of animal products. She doesn't really believe in that anymore. So yeah, um, which is kind of weird. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised by you are what you eat. If you're, again, vegan and you know about nutrition, there's really nothing new here and it can get kind of boring. But obviously this is not for us, right? We are not the intended audience. And I think for the intended audience, it's possibly really effective. I think mostly because of the twins, because of the anecdotes. They're just so likable and so funny and really honest about their experiences. And while, again, I don't think we can really learn anything from the DEXA scans or from the porn watching or anything like that, I do think it's really helpful for people to see like regular people eating healthier and the challenges they face and their experiences. And again, I think the overall message of look at the cost of animal products, like look what it does to the environment, look what it does to our communities. And for what? Like, what are we getting out of this? We, we can clearly live and be healthy without it. It's really great. And even though there is, you know, a, a very clear lack of animal welfare discussion, and that just feels wrong to me, <laughs> I think it's a conscious choice here. And I think it possibly makes sense. You know, I think people probably care a lot more about their health and even about the environment, about the effect on other communities of people than they do animals. And Gardner, again, the senior author, he talks about just how positive this has been. He thinks this has been the most impactful thing he's done uh, in terms of like plant-based eating and getting people to be healthy uh, in the last like 30 years. Obviously, he didn't have a lot of control. I'm sure that was very hard for him and he's not super stoked about the Eric Adams diabetes stuff and the sexual arousal and the DEXA scan stuff. But overall, he thinks it's been really, really positive. And um, yeah, it's it's a nice interview if you want to read it. Check it out. But I would love to know your thoughts if you watched this documentary. I'd love to know what you think about it. Maybe I'm being too harsh. Or maybe I wasn't harsh enough. Maybe there's some other stupid shit that I missed. I would love to know. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing if you do subscribe and like the video and all of that stuff. Thank you so much to my patrons and my members here on YouTube. I do post two exclusive videos a month for tier two patrons and members. So the first one's like a vlog, that one I just posted for this month. And then the second one is a more controversial topic, something unrelated to veganism. The last one was on plagiarism on the H Bomber Guy video, which I think is the most controversial one I've done actually based on the comments. So that's pretty interesting. But uh, yeah, you can head over to patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan and join me there or again here on YouTube. That's it for me, guys. Thanks again. New video soon. You like my little Korox? Some up here, there's one up here. There's one down there. There should be five total. Uh, these were actually a Christmas present for my four-year-old, but uh, they get mad because they're not, they're like little 
fake Lego things. They hold together pretty well, but they're not supposed to be like played with, right? They, they come apart, which makes them mad. So now they're mine. That was not the intention, but uh, I can't say I'm unhappy about it. They are so cute.